Hi, my name is Monika Treut. Uh, I'm a German filmmaker, writer, director and producer. Um, the last part I don't like that much, but it's necessary, unfortunately. So um, my new film is called Generation and it plays in the panorama section of the this year's Berlinale. Um, and it is a follow-up on my film, Gender Knots, uh, which I made in the late 90s. Um, in Gender Knots, I show uh, pioneers of the trans movement in San Francisco, Susan Stryker, Sandy Stone, Maxwell Valerio, Stafford, and I revisit them again in my new film, Generation. Uh, so in generation, we see how much has changed since the late 90s. And um, it shows how um, these pioneers and their supporters, Annie Sprinkle and Bess Stevens, cope with the changed living situation and more and more problems like climate change um, and um, hostilities on all levels and um, gentrification in San Francisco. Um, but I want to give hope as well. It's not only um, has it worsened the living conditions, but there's also new beginnings and new ways of living together, new ways of aging. And so I hope the film will inspire the younger generations. Some people settle in their identity. I certainly have not. Um, I, I think I could still be anywhere in that spectrum, depending upon how I'm relating to um, whoever the other person is. You know, identity is partly constructed in interaction. Um, but I think as people grow older, they grow into themselves but that means differently for different people. Some people are very happy to settle into something, then they don't have to worry about that part of their lives anymore. They can put it on automatic pilot. But some people never give up searching. They never give up adventuring or questioning. That's a journey that they take all their lives. And they are always going to be gender knots. I think I'm probably one of them, and I don't think it's volitional, but I don't necessarily think that's true for everyone. It's certainly true for me. Hello, welcome to Teddy TV. My name is Jean Bor Bobak, and this time we are discussing the film Generation with director Monica Troit. Hello, welcome, Monica. Um, it's really lovely to have you here with us today. Um, can you tell us a bit about, uh, first, about uh, Gender Knots, the, the film that you made earlier and that Generation follows up on? Okay. Um, well, first, uh, thank you for having me uh, and my film Gender Knots. Um, I shot in the late 90s in San Francisco. Uh, and it now feels in retrospect like it was a different era. It was, um, you know, we, we were still believing that the internet was this huge utopian possibility to connect um, all the subcultures. And we were in a way kind of naive with everything. On the other hand, it was a beautiful time to experiment with new gender identities. We had a lot of different spaces, locations. We had the Club Confidential where all kinds of gender benders met. And it was uh, mm. a time of a new beginning. So um, yeah, when I look back, uh, I have to be careful not to become too nostalgic because you know, yeah. as Susan Stryker says, um, time moves on and life moves on. So we should be 
looking forward, not backwards all the time. Yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I was also wondering, why did you decide to revisit uh, Gender Notes in this particular time when you did the film? Well, um, it's, um, yeah, the time has changed so much. And I was very curious to see how um, the gender knots, uh, uh, as I still call them, uh, were able to cope with the changed times right. and how they were able to cope with the horrible things which happened under the Trump presidency in particular, because it was such a rollback in uh, you know, regarding the rights of transgender people, uh, the whole picture looked so grim back then. It is now looking a little better with the new presidency of Biden, but still, you know, we we see it everywhere that there is huge movements of right wing people coming, yeah. and uh, you know, transgender people seem to be. Um, pretty much uh, the target of, of the right wingers worldwide. Yeah, that's that's definitely something that um, that unfortunately we can we can see across um, the entire globe. Um, but now that we are talking about about the U.S. politics in in particular, um, what do you think? How could the situation change now that with all that's happening in the United States? Well, there is uh, a new kind of hope coming. Uh, and especially with the, um, the protagonist in Generation, you can see that they are full of energy, though they are not the youngest anymore. But it gives me so much hope to see um, how... For example, Susan Stryker, who is a really well-known and important academic uh, trans woman, how much she is fighting for a different kind of consciousness, um, foremost in the academia, but also as a public intellectual. So there is, um, and, and you see like Annie Sprinkle and Bess Stevens, who are supporters of the trans movement, how they expand um, their activities into uh, the fight against climate change. Um, so there is all kinds of new developments which give me a lot of hope. Yeah, I think that's, that's very important that we would look into the future with hope. How was it, this experience for you to return to, to the gender knots? Um, well, uh, I really, and I think you can feel it when you see the film, I very much respect uh, each of them. And I can say I really love them. And um, so for me, it was joyful, very joyful to um, get in touch again in real life. So of course, we were in touch by a social media, but as we know, as we all can feel at the moment, oh, yes. it's not the real thing, right? So it's it makes a huge difference when um, you really uh, experience everyday life with them. So as a crew, we were very fortunate that we could stay part of uh, the time when we were shooting at the house of Annie Sprinkle and Bess Stevens in San Francisco. So that was absolutely wonderful to share life and to visit uh, uh, um, Sandy Stone and hang out with her in Santa Cruz and to hang out with Stafford in the desert. So uh, unfortunately, we had a small budget, so we couldn't overextend our time. So we were a little pressured time wise, but still, it was wonderful to share life with them, if only for a short period of time. Yeah, sounds like a, a lovely experience for sure. Um, it, it was interesting for me to see this film in a way that, of course, it tells the personal histories of, of the gender knots, but at the same time, a history of an entire movement takes shape in the film. Could we understand generation as a historiographic project? 
Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's probably a big word for, um, uh, you know, it's, I, I always have a bit of a hesitation to say, um, so we see uh, certain people and can we really extend um, for, from these individual people into a historical movement? I'm not so sure about that. It's more for historians or archivists to decide, right? As a filmmaker, I'm basically just uh, focusing on people I know and people I have um, access to. Uh, and in this particular uh, case with generation, I believe um, these people are quite important, of course, and they are now coming of age. And that was also what interested me quite a bit. How is it when you, you know, you're in your late 50s, in your 60s, and in your 80s, in the case of Sandy Stone, how does life change when you get older, especially for trans people? How does that go? Because I mean, you know, you 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 are quite young, and everybody around Berlinale right now, I feel like I'm pretty much the oldest uh, person around, and my protagonists are also quite, uh, you know, much older than most people are who are right now in in the center of Berlinale or Teddy, which I find beautiful that this way. Uh, I can be in touch with a younger generation. But so I'm also curious to, to get to know how, um, you know, the account of lives of older people, older trans people um, or trans supporters, how is it for you guys when you watch it, if I may ask you a question? No, of course. I mean, I think it's very inspiring. That's the first word that would come to my mind and that I felt... Um, watching uh, Generation, but also I think it's just so important that we would hear these stories, we would see particular perspective as well, because obviously, especially in this time that we live in, when there is like just so much information and everything has to be so immediate and you constantly have to be like two, three, four a million steps ahead of yourself um, to make things, it's really... I find it very comforting and very important at the same time to look back on the past and to hear these stories and to see how the trajectory of these of these people influenced actually the very current time that we live in. So for me it was definitely a very great thing to to see to see this to see this film. Thank yeah. you. No, of course. Um yes, um what was also very interesting to me, and then with this we come to the very present time, is uh, that basically all the characters addressed um, this immense change that happened in San Francisco. And with that, like these quiet, crude mechanisms of this global capitalism also entered the, the narrative. Can you talk a bit about this? Yeah, <clears throat> that's um, gentrification, right? The big word um, which um, influences the lives of so many people these days. And I believe um, that this is one of um, the most, um, yeah, the most important problems we are having in our times. Um, we don't have spaces anymore. Um, they are taken away from us. Uh, in, in the case of gender knots and generation, you can see in gender knots uh, more than 20 years ago, it was still possible for artists and freelancers to afford a place in the city of San Francisco. And uh, with um, the uh, big um, you know, companies in Silicon Valley, uh, and the influx of uh, techies, the young um, people who work for Google and Facebook and all the other internet companies, they make so much money that they bought a lot of places in the city. And it's a small city, San Francisco. 
um, and they bought brought up everything, and so rents went up. Um, and um, yeah, it's just very hard, and it's a worldwide development, unfortunately, Absolutely. for quite some years. That um, uh, it's you know the basic right of housing is uh, endangered. Uh, we can see it in all the big cities on, on this planet, people moving into cities, people uh, have having problems to uh, pay their rents, people are forced to move away from the cities and to the, to the suburbs, and people spend so much um, money on just the basic right of um, having a roof uh, over their heads. Yeah. And that's uh, very, very unfortunate when people are forced to work so hard and um, have little time to think and little time to create and meet other people. So it's one of the greatest problems right now, I, I believe. Yeah, and it really seemed like from the film as well that it has a particularly heavy effect on on creative communities. Um, because, yeah, we see like quite an eloquent portrait of how it was in the 90s in San Francisco and all the characters are thinking back on it with this sweet nostalgia. And then right now they are a bit dispersed around uh, the United States and, and of course that creates some obstacles as well for, for creating and thinking together and, and, and coming together. Yeah, absolutely. And plus, um, it's not only the private housing problem, it's also uh, we are missing uh, bookstores, we are missing cafes, we're missing mm. bars, we're missing meeting places. So yeah. it feels like we are more and more forced to meet each other, um, you know, on the internet, uh, yeah. which we are doing Which now. we are doing right now, exactly. <laughs> we are doing right now, yeah. Yeah. So, and it's um, the, the way of physically meeting, physically um, exchanging, um, and physically working together. It's It has become a luxury. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Right? And, I, and I absolutely have to say that this is like a, an incredibly bizarre experience to, to do this whole festival thing through online spaces compared to what we had in the past years it's yeah it's 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 an interesting challenge for everyone probably um yeah but um i would like to come to this idea of of um of family because there are uh, in a very direct way as well there are different family uh, models portrayed in the film particularly it was very moving to see um sandy stone uh, with with uh, with her family but also community functions very often as a family and i think um i think susan striker says in the movie but i'm not 100% sure about that excuse me it's uh, but but i think she says networks of kinship are crucial um and um and yeah and i i was wondering um how do you see this uh, this duality of of different family models and community as a as a family yeah, it's uh, as you said. Um, there is different models of family, like for example, Sandy Stone. Um, for me, she is like a matriarch. Uh, she has um, a very interesting model of family. Um, it's a group of like fifteen people, um, and they have a very interesting ways of procreating. It's um, through uh, modern technology, it's uh, egg donors, and it's sperm from uh, gay men who are friends of the lesbian women. And so it's a, it's a huge, interesting patchwork family um, Sandy has created there. And they all now live together in this huge house when you know, when we shot the film, they just got the house and were just looking at the house and trying to find out whether it was possible for the big family to move in there all together. Um, so, and um, Susan Stryker is talking about a different type of 
family. It's uh, more like an expanded kind of group of um, like-minded people who support each other and who uh, have a similar interest and, uh, you know, support each other in a way um, that, you know, one person makes more money than the others. And so they, they put the money together and it's the, the old model pretty much of uh, having a, in German, a Wohngemeinschaft, right. like a community living. Um, and that's, that seems to become more important than ever because, uh, you know, the living conditions change so much and some people um, who really are, have a great education and stuff are losing their jobs and other people like Stafford um, has uh, his own moving business so he has to work really hard to drive around the country and uh, move other people's stuff and so um, it's with the, the fast changing living conditions it's more important than ever to create communities and support each other. Yeah, you worked on this film as well and many, many other films together with Elfie Mikesh. And mm -hmm. um, I found it, like the camera work particularly, it was so interesting. There were so many moments in the film when, when what you see actually nothing is really happening in, in certain moments, but it's just so telling, it gives, it somehow translates so beautifully this this feeling of community between these people and 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 it also really showed that you have a very close and intimate relationship with um with the protagonists of the film can you talk about your work with Elfie together and how you approached um the camera work and and the aesthetic of the film um yeah, with Elfie, I have such a long history of working together that we understand each other without uh, talking too much. So we we are in tune, so to say, and um, we talk beforehand. And then once we are in a situation, it is very smooth, the working together. So uh, it's almost organically. Um, and in this, this film, we also had a few younger people who helped us. I had two students of mine who came with me and they just jumped into the cold water and were, you know, part of the crew, but also in a very organic way. Um, so, yeah, it's, um, I think it's very important when you do small films and especially in documentary filmmaking that you have a good understanding uh, in your little crew and that you um, have trust in each other and you don't have to talk too much when it comes to the actual shooting. And in terms of the aesthetic of the film, it was basically just very easy just to uh, try to be close to the protagonists. And then also we needed quite um, a few images of the wideness of the landscape mm, and yeah. moments where we have just a little peace and quiet so we can digest um, what the um, protagonists are talking about. Because sometimes we have, especially with Susan Stryker, we have some you know, tough stuff to think about. So, and we needed some, some pauses, some breaks to, to breathe in between uh, the encounters. Yeah, yeah, certainly. And I mean, exactly. I think, yeah, it's pretty um, heavy and sometimes very complex ideas are floating around, but it's also very inspiring. Like I started to read up on what Susan is, is mm -hmm. working and stuff because it was just so interesting. Um, yeah, very often filmmaking and activism go hand in hand, particularly when, um, when minorities or marginalized groups are being portrayed. Would you consider your body of work in line with, with this type of activism? Uh, I wish for it. You never know with films, right? Um, 
And especially right now, it's so weird because as filmmakers at the Berlinale right now, we don't really know how our films are digested and seen by, yeah. by the audience. So um, I always wish for, uh, for the films to inspire people, to mm. encourage people. Uh, right now, it's um, it's like the films are streaming in into nowhere land. Yeah. Um, so, in of course, you know, to answer your question, um, yeah, I've, I I see my my work as um, trying to be on you know in line with uh, progressive movements, um, and I wish to to support and strengthen the, uh, the trans movement. I wish to, to encourage uh, young people to be courageous about their identities and to be also, you know, not just focused on your own individual identity, but to also see the bigger picture mm. and to be in tune with uh, progressive movements for better living conditions for everybody. Right. Yeah, certainly. I mean, these the, these are all very important, and it's very beautifully uh, put. I was also wondering, um, you as a pioneer of LGBTQ plus uh, filmmaking, um, how do you see the current queer cinema landscape? We. Oui. <laughs> That's a big question. I think the queer cinema landscape is very diverse, right? So it's, um, how can I say, um, you know, on one hand, I'm very, very happy that uh, the uh, queer cinema landscape is so wide and diverse these days. And we have so much more product out to to watch and to, to read and to um, engage in. Um, I think... I'm not a film critic and I'm not an archivist or uh, a film, uh, you know, theory person. I, I think other people have to answer this question. All right. Sorry for backing out. But no, don't worry. Then yeah. I will ask the question from other people as well. That's, uh, that's for sure. Uh, Monica Troit, thank you very much um, for being here with us and uh, talking to us. I wish you all the best for this interesting Berlinale experience that is uh, still going on. And hopefully in June, we will be okay. able to see yeah. each other in person as well. That'd be lovely. Thank yeah. you so much. So, huh? Thank Take you. Care and have a good good day today. Thank you. Not you so too. Work, huh? ah, there is still a bit, but yeah, we will manage for sure. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Take care.